our last class, uh, we're going to talk about sin and its remedy as part of our understanding of the life and teachings of Jesus. Um, you don't need to know any of the rest of this because the only thing after, after this lecture is the final exam. So let's talk about sin and its remedy in the context of Jesus and the Incarnation. First, let me say one of the, one of the standard responses to any discussion of sin in the modern days is, well, there is no such thing. You know, there's no such thing as sin. Probably people would say there's not even any such thing as evil. It's just that society has kind of oppressed people. People get, you know, get the environment that they're in causes them grief, and so they act out. And that is not the biblical model. You know, that's the New Age model. The biblical model is that uh, the devil is a real personality, that their temptation is real, and sin is real. My, one of my old friends in college who became a Christian when I knew him, and then later on went on to become a pastor, Tim Waits, when he was really seeking, some of you have heard me tell the story. When Tim was really seeking and really trying to find the truth, he visited a bunch of different religious groups on our campus, because we had all kinds of different groups. Um, and he went to a Baha'i group. I think he had just been to a Baha'i group when we had this conversation. And um, he said, you know, these folks I just talked to and others that I've talked to say that human beings are, are really good. We're basically good. That it's just our environment that causes us to do things we shouldn't, but we are good beings. And Tim said, you know, I hear that and I think to myself, if that's true, then why is it so hard to be good and so easy to be bad? He was expressing the practical reality of the fact that we are fallen creatures. We are beings that are prone to sin. And sin is a real thing. It is anything that denies the grace and glory and will of God. Anything in us that is contrary to the way God desires it to be. But it is a real thing. And so as we start talking about sin and its remedy, I want to make sure you understand that premise first. That, um, that biblically speaking, sin is very real. Now, in response to that, Jesus came as our Savior. As I said in my prayer, not just a great teacher, not just a model for everyone, not just someone, if we were all more like him, the world would be a better place. He came to save us from our lostness, from our brokenness. Three scripture verses which affirm that, uh, the when when... Joseph is spoken to by Gabriel. Gabriel explains why it is that Mary is pregnant uh, as a virgin. And the angel says, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Jesus is um, a version of Joshua. Joshua is a Hebrew name which means God saves. You will give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. There it is. Jesus came to save people from their sins. Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. In Matthew 26, 28, 29, Jesus, when he gave the, uh, the, the, uh, the bread and the wine as communion at the Last Supper, he said, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus wasn't just a great teacher. He was our Savior. He came in order to save us from our sins and to reconcile us back to God. We were made for a relationship with God. <clears throat> That's why we were created. That's why God made us in His image, so that we could have a relationship with each other. Our sinfulness, the, the betrayal of humanity against the love of God, broke that relationship. Bless you. Thank you. And so we needed some way for that to be reconciled, some, some way for that relationship to be rebuilt, for that the, the, a bridge to cross the chasm between us and God the Father. Well, it's not possible for us to build that bridge from our side. We are not adequate to that. And so God built the bridge from His side by being incarnate, by God coming to us in the form of a human being and connecting those two again and by His sacrifice on the cross, redeeming us from our sins. So, the Jewish people, historically, as, as you well know from the classes, had trouble accepting Jesus as the Messiah, and the main reason they had trouble accepting Jesus as the Messiah is they had a preconceived idea what the Messiah was about. 
And that was that the Messiah was going to come and defeat their enemies and drive off their oppressors. The way Judas Maccabeus had done with Seleucids, they thought the Messiah was going to come and do that with the Romans. The reason they couldn't accept Jesus is he didn't do that. But the point was, Jesus tried to tell them, your real enemy isn't the Romans. That's not the enemy that I came to, to defeat and to drive off. The enemy I came to defeat and drive off is the devil and sin. That's your real enemy. The rest of this is just a, you know, a, a blip in history. So this is why Jesus, this is how Jesus fulfilled the objective of, of the Messiah to drive away, you know, to defeat the enemy and drive away the oppressor. But if the Jews thought it was the Romans, and it wasn't, it was the devil and it was sin. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so Jesus came as Savior. That was the primary part of why he came to earth. Secondly, we need to think about what our sins meant to Jesus. What does it mean that we are sinful? Um, again, people, some people would say sin isn't real or that sin is, um, you know, sin is a, a philosophical construct. You know, it's a conceptual thing that we need to overcome. Jesus never deals with sin in the abstract or in a speculative way. Jesus always deals with sin as something concrete and practical, as I said a minute ago, as something that is real. It is a disease for which a cure is needed. And that's probably the best way for us to think about sin. The introduction of sin into the world by our ancient ancestors um, betraying God and, and rebelling against God and denying the relationship with God, when that happened, they introduced sin into the world. And it became, from that moment on, a pervasive plague, a plague which is passed down from generation to generation, just like a genetic disease. And so we have the, you know, the burden of sin that we have inherited because of being a human being. And so a cure was needed for that disease. Jesus Christ came to provide that cure, and those of us who have received Jesus have received, in effect, the spiritual inoculation against that. We are not completely healed yet. Some people are more healed than others. Some people are further along in the, in the healing process, and that's why some people are more holy than others, are more righteous than others, are less... That's why there are great saints in, in the history of the world. None of us will be completely cured until the final consummation, in which the plague of sin will be, will be eradicated, and we will no longer be under its bondage. But the cure has been provided. That was the nature of Jesus coming to earth. Now, Jesus also, we need to see, was the first one to reveal the true inwardness of sin. The Pharisees were really big about talking about sin, you know, all, of the, all of the Jews who were seeking righteousness. But the sins they talked about were um, sins of the flesh. Doing the wrong things with your body, eating the wrong things with your body, doing things outside. The whole pharisaical kind of idea of sin was an external kind of thing. Jesus comes along and says, yes, those are sins if you, you, know, if you commit adultery or whatever. But more critical than that and underlying all of that is the idea of internal sin. Sins like pride, which is the, the parent of all sins, or lust, or hate, or envy, or bitterness, or greed, or malice, those aren't external things, those are internal things. Jesus said, for instance, it's not what you take into your body, not what you eat, talking about the, the Mosaic um, uh, code with regard to clean and unclean foods, it is not what you take into your body, but what comes out of your body, because that is a reflection of a darkness in your heart. The words that you speak, the things that come out of you, reflect a much more serious problem in terms of sinfulness in your heart than do breaking the, you know, the dietary laws. So Jesus focused on the fact that internal sins, the sins of the heart, are much worse than the sins of the flesh. This is something the Pharisees could not get. This is something most Christians <clears throat> cannot get. <clears throat> Christians who, who, in their pride, condemn other people for doing something they think is wrong and sitting in judgment on them when they don't, without realizing that the pride, the self-satisfaction that leads <clears throat> them to sit in judgment on somebody else is a worse sin. 
But they are sinning in a greater way than those who have actually done something on the outside that is contrary to what God said. The darkest of sins are sins in the heart. I've told the story many times of Carolyn and I being at the Indigo Girls concert and a bunch of cars showing up and I didn't even know when we went to the concert the Indigo Girls were lesbians. And so there are a lot of public displays of affection between women in this line waiting to get into the concert. A bunch of cars show up, people roll out of these cars and they hold up signs that say things like homosexuals will burn in hell forever. Who was the greater sinner? I think those people were. I think they are liable for a worse judgment because their sin was pride. Their sin was, was anger towards somebody else. Their sin was condemnation. Not saying Jesus loves you, you know, and he wants you to be healthy and, and whole and, you know. No, that was completely the wrong thing. That is what Jesus was talking about. They had it wrong. I'm not saying that sins of the flesh or sins of outside, external sins, are okay. Jesus didn't either. But he said the worst of the sins are the darkness that you have inside of you and how that gets reflected. Yes? I had someone come to me that said um, they knew uh, someone was living together and they felt that in the Bible it had said that as Christians we should confront people um, that uh, particularly I, I assume meant going to church and um, uh, I kind of just steered the conversation to letting the minister handle it, whatever he was doing. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about you. <laughs> but um, uh, because I didn't, you know, uh, how I didn't know how to interpret that because there was a passage, and and um, uh, when you were talking about that, where does that fit in with that? Well, it it said it does say. That if someone, if a brother or sister is in sin, then you need to go to them and talk with them about it. If they won't listen to you, then two people should go. If two people, if they won't respond to two people, then, you know, the church should get involved. But, how you get involved is a big part of it. I used the example earlier, I think it was in this class, um, story of two ministers in the late 19th century. And uh, they would get together regularly, and they got together and were talking. One of them says, well, what did you preach on last week? Um, and the other one said, I preach that sinners will be cast into hell. And the other minister, after a pause, said, well, did you do it with tenderness? That's the perfect question. Our concern is not to tell other people how awful they are, but rather to tell them that Jesus wants the best for them, and he loves them. I have a very dear friend who was part of a Christian fellowship when I was in college, um, after he left college, he came out, and he's been involved in a relationship with a much older man. This has been quite a few years now. And when we got back together, uh, I hadn't seen him in ages, and we both went to the ordination of a friend of ours. And I, I spent the evening talking with, with uh, this, this old friend, and at the end of the time, he invited me to come and visit him at a farm he lives on uh, near Baltimore. And I said, I, I don't know if I'll ever have a chance to, but if I'm coming through that way, I'll let you know. When he left, another mutual friend who has continued to be closer to, uh, to this man said, you don't realize what just happened. Virtually everyone that he knew from his Christian life has rejected him and condemned him and told him that he is, you know, he's, he's violating you know, God's will and he is going to be condemned for it. And the idea that he would invite somebody from his old life to come and visit him at his home which meant where his partner also lived and, you know, the whole thing. It's just unbelievable. And I said, well, I love him. He is a dear friend of mine. I will always want the best for him. If I have difficulty with him being involved in the relationship that he's involved in, it's not out of judgment. It's out of concern. It's out of love. Because based on what Scripture says, I don't think that's the best thing for him. But I'm not going to condemn him. What, what good would that do? That would damage me and it would hurt him. You know, how do I achieve God's will in that? The same thing is true with any of those kinds of things. We, I learned from our pastor in Seattle, and we will always maintain it here, from our pulpit and in our church, you will always hear us talking about the things we are for, not the things we are against. I don't believe people ultimately are, are driven into the arms of, of Jesus because somebody scared them because of their sin. 
but rather because they learn what the grace of Christ is about, what the love of God is about, what the mercy that Jesus desires. That doesn't mean that it's okay for us to do things that God doesn't want us to do. Don't miss, I'm not saying that. Jesus didn't say that. But what was his focus? His focus was on the kingdom of God, the grace. He still talked about judgment, as I'm going to talk about in just a minute, that there are consequences. But how do we deal with others? How do I as a minister or how do you as a layperson deal with that? You know, do we do it with tenderness? Do we do it with grace? Do we do it with humility? There but by the grace of God go I. Christian faith is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Not somebody acting like they're royalty all of a sudden. Okay. Kenneth, you've had your hand up. Sorry. I, I guess along those same lines, what blew my mind when I was in my way and one of our leaders came and talked about how he was in charge of providing security for this great big conference and they found out that there was a homosexual group that was going to come and protest this conference. He said there were some guys that showed up and he said our biggest we had to, the biggest thing we had to do was protect those guys from being beat up by Christians. Yeah. yeah. Well, and Jesus hung out with sinners. I oh, mean, yeah. That, 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 those were his favorite people. <laughs> exactly. I was just, just going to say, Jesus' favorite people were sinners. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the big things that the, that the Jews had against him is he hung out with all the wrong people. Tax collectors, which was the worst thing, and prostitutes, and all manner of evil people. Evil by the Jews. Now, again, that doesn't mean Jesus ever said... It's a, Matthew, as a tax collector, it's okay that you continue to scrape money off the top and cheat people. He didn't say that. He did not tell the prostitutes that he hung out with, it's okay for you to keep doing that. In fact, he said, um, like the woman who was caught in adultery, and Jesus says, like he was without, the, without sin, cast the first stone. And he's like down on, down on the ground sort of writing something, and they, one at a time, sort of guilty, wander off. Jesus looks up, and there's nobody there but the woman, and he says, woman, where are your accusers? And she said, well, they left. And he said, well, neither do I condemn you. But you know what else he said? Go and sin no more. He did not condemn her, but he did tell her, that's not okay. Don't do that anymore. Okay. Consistently. Marvin? Um, if you ever try to take a bone away from the dog, you know you have to fight, and as soon as you want to tell somebody that they can't be homosexual or they can't steal or they can't, they're not going to they're not going to give that up unless you give them something better. Yeah. And I think of Jesus with the Samaritan woman, and he said, "Go get your husband." She says, "Well, I don't have one." You know, and he says, "If if you knew that I could give you living water," so he's already giving her something else and getting her interested. Right. And she went to the village and brought the other people to hear what he had to say. And she said, "I found the Messiah. He has told me everything I about did. myself, everything I ever did." So, absolutely true. Our job is to share the grace and mercy and love of Jesus. That's what will draw people. And yet we presume that our job is to make everybody else aware of their sins and to feel as bad about it as possible. Yes? So many people like to take over the Holy Spirit's job. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> conviction. Conviction is the Holy Spirit's job. It is not ours. Okay. So, um, and I always love the quote from D.L. Moody. You know, D.L. Moody he started Moody Bible Institute and, you know, there's Moody Radio and everything now. He was a great preacher in, in Chicago, a layman who became a preacher in, in one of the biggest churches in America at that time. And somebody asked him one time, said, Pastor Moody, why don't you preach more against sin and sinfulness in people? And Moody said, you know, I have so much trouble with D.L. Moody's sins, it's hard for me to condemn somebody else. <laughs> okay? There's the humility. So, okay, so the, the idea, though, that Jesus identified that internal sins, the darkness in our hearts and in our souls were worse than the external sins. And yet we don't get that. And Jesus also made a point, we often miss this, that, that while sin was breaking of a law or a rule or a commandment, it was breaking of things that are made clear to us uh, that are God's will in Scripture, more important to that, Jesus revealed that breaking, that sinning is to break a heart. In a very real way, when we sin, when we, when we consciously violate God's will for our lives, especially if we are Christians, but for any of us, we're adding another nail to the cross. We are, you know, we're literally sort of um, turning our back on God's great love for us. We are denying the fact that He has loved us so much and done so much for us. You know, it's like if, you know, Carolyn... I know Carolyn loves me. If I do something intentionally 
to hurt her or that I know is not good for her. I'm doing more than just doing something wrong. I'm, I'm hurting someone who loves me and who I love. That's what sin is. And, and Jesus made sure we understood that. And if we put it in context of a loving relationship and a violation of a loving relationship, it changed the whole dynamic. It no longer is, you broke a rule, but rather, you bruised the heart of God in a very real way. Because he loves you so much and he's done so much for you. That's a very different idea and a very different way of, of, we have a very different way of dealing with it once we have that understanding. But that's much of what Jesus was sharing uh, when he talked about sin. Okay? Now, the third point is Jesus did make it clear that there were consequences of sin. That sin has its consequences. And, and it doesn't just mean that God will nuke you for having done something he didn't want, but rather that there are natural consequences that will uh, evolve from our sin. Jesus says that sins often are visited with outward penalties, and I like this quote. Charles Kingsley has said, just as a wheel in a piece of machinery, should be of machinery, sorry, punishes itself when it gets out of gear. If we are outside the will of God, if we are not in the place we should be because we've chosen to sin, then things are going to go wrong for us. We're going to get miserable. You know, I have known people in my life that have decided to live profligate lives, in other words, and just sort of with abandon, libertine kind of things. And I've never known one of them that was happy. Okay, there may have been pleasures associated with that, but they weren't happy because they were out of gear. They were not in the place God intended for them to be. The fact is that there are consequences to sin, and not always because God does something to us, but rather, as I say here, we often find that we have to lie in the beds that we make. A person commits adultery, and the person they commit adultery with becomes, you know, the woman becomes pregnant. There's a child involved. Decisions that are made are of evil consequence, either direction. Everybody else is affected. When Scripture talks about the fact that, um, you know, that people being affected to the second and third generation, you know, for sin. I don't think that's necessarily that God decides he's going to condemn children and grandchildren for something that, that the parents did, but rather that when a parent commits sin, there are consequences that will affect the second and third generation. Somebody goes out and kills somebody, gets put in prison for life, and they've got three kids, what happens to their family? They suffer. They suffer emotionally, they probably suffer financially, they suffer socially. They carry that stigma. Uh, it's, it's just it's a, um, an accepted fact that things like abuse are multi-generational. We pass those things on to our kids. So the fact is that there are consequences to sin. In particular, sin has inward dire results, more dire even than any external things. For instance, sin leads to a bad conscience. It leads to guilt. Um, a wonderful parable related to all of this is the parable of the prodigal son. And the prodigal son who, of course, you know the story, he took his inheritance, he told his father, I don't want to wait for my inheritance, I want to take it now. So he took his inheritance, he went off to a distant land, and he wasted it all in wild living. And then when it was all gone, he had no way to support himself. He literally was feeding pigs, which for a Jewish boy to do would be the, you know, that's the worst possible thing. And he realized, here I am feeding these pigs, and I want to eat what I'm having to feed the pigs. I'm so hungry. My father's servants are eating better than I am. They're living better than I am. I will go back and apologize to my father and ask if I can just be a servant. So the son goes back, and when, he's, when his father sees him, his father runs out to him, and the prodigal son says, I have, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. There's that, the conscience, the brokenness of a bad conscience, the guilt that he felt for that. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Of course, that parable goes on, and the father welcomes him back and says, my son was dead, he's now alive. He brings his best robe and ring, and he has him kill the fatted calf um, because my son is reborn to me. Okay? But the son felt the consequences of you know, a brokenness, a bad conscience. Secondly, an enslaved will. The passage in Luke 4.18 um, 
says that Jesus says he came to preach good news to the poor, freedom to the prisoner, and to set the oppressed free. The idea that the prisoners and the oppressed, those who give themselves over to sin, become enslaved. They are slaves to their passions. They are slaves to sin. Now, all of us, we are all sinners. John is very clear. He says, if you say you're without sin, you're a liar, and the truth is not in you. But for some of us, sin is, um, is a slip. For others, it's a way of life. And the more we allow sin to be the dominant thing in our life, or a dominant thing in our life, the more inclined we are to it, the more enslaved we are to it. Quite frequently, get to a point, almost like a physical addiction to a drug, where we're no longer able to break out of it anymore. We are literally enslaved to it. Okay. And the passage in John 8.34 says, Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And I think the indication is there is someone who lives in a, in a way that they continue to sin. You know, if we slip, if we fall, if we commit a sin, we recognize it, we confess it, we ask for forgiveness, and we try to move on, that's different than perpetuating a sin in our life, something we continue to do. That is what brings us into slavery. Thirdly, um, sin causes us to have a hardened heart. The more we walk away from God, the more we willfully choose to sin, the harder it is for us to be open and sensitive to the things of God. And fourth... Sin causes a loss of fellowship with God. In our spiritual disciplines class, we talked about prayer and some of the things that block prayer in our lives, a sense of effective prayer. And one of them is um, unconfessed sin in our life, particularly perpetual sin, sin that we continue to dwell in or continue to practice. Uh, God, as a holy and righteous God, cannot look on sin. He loves us and He's anxious to forgive us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we are dwelling in our sin, then our prayer life is not going not to be satisfying. In fact, it may feel completely empty. And when people feel like their prayer is not working, my prayers aren't getting through, I don't have a sense of communicating with God, perhaps it's because God, you are too far away from God because of your sin. And Jesus told us about that. Um, in, in Matthew 5, 8, the passage I, I have up here, it's from the Beatitudes, and it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Well, I think we need to see that the converse is also true. Those who are not pure in heart because of uh, perpetual sin or, or continuing sin in their life are not going to be able to see God. God is going to see much further away until that sin is dealt with. So it does create a loss of fellowship. Now, all these are things, you'll notice that my quotes are all from, from the Gospels. These are all things that Jesus said. Um, and then consequence to others. And that, by the way, is why this fits into the life of teaching of Jesus. The consequence of our sins to others. Um, this Luke 20 passage says, They devour widows' houses, and for a show, make lengthy prayers. When we are, again, practicing perpetual sin, ongoing sin, we find ourselves uh, doing things that have consequences to others. Sometimes it, it means our children, our families, others, but people around us as well who are broken and stricken, sometimes as a direct result, sometimes as an indirect result of our sin. And then finally, a dire result is judgment. Again, Jesus is very clear. God is not one who just says, well, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, I know. I, I know you messed up. Ah, well, you're trying, so you're fine. God is not our grandfather. There are plain, it's very clear that God says that at a certain point, we are going to be held accountable for those things. This passage in Matthew 25, which is the story of the sheep and the goats, where Jesus says, as much as you, uh, you know, as much as you cared for the least of these brothers of mine, you cared for me. Well, he's got two groups who say, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? When did we see you, you know, in need of clothing or in prison? And Jesus said, as much as you did for one of the least of these, you've done it to me. At the end of that, he's got these two groups. Those who cared for him by caring for those in need. Those who did not care for him by those who did not care, uh, those who did not care for those in need. And Jesus says, depart from me, you accursed. To those who didn't care for those in need, depart from me, you accursed, into the lake of fire prepared for the, de for the devil and his demons, for I never, never knew you. And it says, those will go away to eternal punishment. There is judgment. God is a loving God. He is a merciful God. He has given us 
so many chances, and he continues to give us chances, to recognize our own failing, our own sin, and to ask for that sin to be dealt with by the grace of Christ. At a certain point, he's going to draw a line and say, that's enough. And there will be judgment. And we have to recognize that. Okay? We will be held accountable, ultimately. Questions or comments about that? All right. I'm dealing with uh, unforgiveness at this point, and realizing, you know, as in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we can give those who trespass against us. That's the only requirement of us, and we feel justified in hang, hanging on to anger and resentment and bitterness towards other people for real or often imagined right. trespasses. You know, and we are not the judge, and he does ask us to forgive, and he asks us to turn the other cheek if they smite one, and to give the coat as well as the shirt. And, right. Um, for a long time, I walked outside of God's flock, if you like, and, and I don't have a lot of resentments and judgments and so on and so forth, and I've got a lot to deal with if I, I want to get to that position where I really feel that I can communicate properly with God. I think that's the sin that we just don't really recognize. It's we're resentful because others are wrong. Well, they're wrong and they're God's problem. <coughs> yeah. Well, and I, I want to assure you about something, Marvin, all of us. If you're troubled by that, it's probably okay. <laughs> if that's something that troubles your heart, then I think that you're you're probably okay. And you need to get you need to forgive yourself. You need to give, give yourself some grace in that and move forward. And um, because, again, when, when we, it's when we feel self-righteous that we have a problem. It's when, if, if we feel troubled because we find ourselves holding, you know, holding grudges. Because sometimes our hurt, our own brokenness can come out in terms of bitterness towards somebody else. And so I think that if we... If we give that to the Lord in terms of giving Him our brokenness and let Him deal with that, then I think that we can find healing from that. But the very fact that, that if, if we ever feel troubled by that, then that means we're probably on the road to healing, you know, and then we're okay. It's when we feel self-righteous and say, there it is, and they deserve it! <laughs> That's when we have a problem. Well, it came really true a few days ago when we met a lady that I perceived that really done something bad, and and uh, and I could tell that she was completely oblivious to all of this, and I'm feeling this anger and resentment, like I don't even want to talk to her, and, and you know she's a terrible person, and I had to admit to God, she probably doesn't know that I was offended, yeah. but I'm carrying this, and it's hurting me. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's true, it hurts us. Yeah. People who have bitterness and they think, oh, that horrible person. Right, right, right. And, and who are you getting back at by feeling that way? Who's being damaged by all of that? It's not them. They probably are oblivious, as you say, oblivious to the fact that, you know, they got a problem. We're hurting ourselves when we do that. And, we, and I, I've struggled with that. I have a brother who has not, except in a couple of required instances, like when, when our parents died, has not spoken to me in six years, seven years, more. When did we go to New Zealand? Because that's what happened. Um, and I was really angry with him and everything else. I've tried to reconcile with him, and he refuses. And I don't have any bitterness toward him anymore. Okay? It, it was his fault. I mean, he screwed up. And I can honestly say that, because I spent a lot of time saying, what did I do wrong in this process? Okay? And I finally came, I think the Lord gave me the assurance, I didn't do anything wrong. He, he has problems. Problems that affect his perceptions. And... I don't hold any grudges against him. I would be happy to reconcile tomorrow if he'd be willing to. But um, I, I, don't, I don't have any bitterness. But it's also not my fault. So I can't own that either. And so I, I, I'm okay. But I went through a period of time where I was either, either self-doubting or self-critical or angry at him or blaming him or whatever. And now I just think, well, Lord, you know, in your will, I would like for that to be reconciled. But I no longer am angry at him. I don't blame, no longer blame myself. Sometimes we just have to kind of move to neutral ground and count on the Lord to be the one in charge. Get it? I, I'm just got my arms. Okay, just I waving around back. I probably <laughs> make comments. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, a fourth thing that I want to talk about 
is the remedy for sin, which is the focus of this whole talk. Again, the principle here is that we are unable to heal ourselves. All of humanity is broken in some way. Um, most of you have heard me say, especially if you came to the Easter service, as best we can tell, there has never been a culture anywhere in human history, the anthropologists would say, that, did not, that has not had some form of religion, some at least belief in the supernatural or something beyond the physical world, uh, the spiritual, something. Likewise, there has never been a culture, as far as we know, that has not had some kind of sense that there's something wrong with us. That there is something broken in us. That there is human beings' tendency toward loneliness and lostness, um, toward melancholy. All people get there uh, at some point, and some people dwell in that all the time. This idea that there simply is something wrong. Well, that something wrong, the Christian faith says, is that we were made for a relationship with God, and that relationship has been broken. And so, and sin is the cause of that. And so the remedy for sin was and is forgiveness, it is reconciliation back to our intended relationship with God, and it is restoring, again, of that lost relationship. That we are back in the place we meant to be. Because all other relationships, so many people think that they're going to find their satisfaction in a romantic relationship. For instance. Well, romantic relationships are wonderful. God made us so that those are very satisfying things. But the problem is, if we think that's the thing that's going to give us the deep desires of our heart, if we think that's all we need, we're going to miss it. That's why half of all people who get married get divorced, is because their expectations of that relationship are wrong. A husband or a wife alone cannot satisfy the hunger that you have in your heart. They can only do it in the context of having a prior and more foundational relationship with God. That's true with men and women. In that context, it's the most wonderful thing in the world. But apart from that context, it will not satisfy. And so, so many marriages end up broken because of that. Now, this, the need for forgiveness, reconciliation, restoring a lost relationship, is exactly why Jesus came. Uh, Jesus is the centerpiece of God's plan for forgiveness and reconciliation. Again, God knew we did not have it in us to be able to fix this problem. We could not build the bridge from our side. So God determined to do it from his side, because he is able. And Jesus not only proclaimed forgiveness was available in terms of reconciliation to God, but he embodied it. He literally, in his body, in his incarnation, represented that to us. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 says, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. This one short little verse has it all in there. It was our sins that had caused us to be denied or to have the relationship broken with God. And yet it was God's desire to overcome that brokenness, to reconcile the world, and the world means the people. It's not, this is not creation in general. This is the people. God was reconciling all of us to himself in Christ because it is in Christ that our sins are covered and taken away and atoned for. Okay? That little verse, 2 Corinthians 5.19, summarizes the whole of the Christian message. What the problem is, that God initiated the response and that that response was in the incarnation and the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. Okay? And then Jesus' declaration of forgiveness was affirmed and completed in his own death on the cross. On the cross, Jesus took all of our sins on himself, removing the barrier that kept us from God the Father and rebuilding that bridge of reconciliation. And then, by his resurrection from the dead, someone has said that Jesus, is, Jesus paid the price for our sins, but the resurrection was, was evidence that the check had cleared, that he was successful in paying the price for our sins. So the crucifixion and the resurrection and our expectation that he will come again. He came the first time to be our savior, he will come the second time to be our Lord, to be the one who will rule over all creation. Okay. So the whole point of the incarnation and of Jesus' life and his sacrificial death and his resurrection was exactly this. It was that he provides the remedy for sin and in doing so brings us back into relationship with God the Father. Questions about that? Or comments?
Judy. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, you know, in Kings and all that, if, if God punishes people, he, they, they die, they get sick, they get, yep. there's, there's killings. And, and so you can see why people say, well, what's so loving about this God that he causes all these disasters to happen and yeah. all of that? Well, what does he do after he does that judgment? Jesus. Well, but immediately after, in every case, God takes them back. Okay. Um, and I know for us, when we think about people dying, getting sick, you know, plagues, Moses and the Levites taking their swords out after the golden calf, you know, killing people and all that. And yet, on a cosmic scale, <laughs> this is, is a parallel to the fact that if you have a child, and the child does something deserving of punishment, and you spank them, you know, you don't inflict serious bodily injury, but you spank them, or you send them to your room, and you do something to punish, you know, and they're crying, and, you know, you don't love me, and uh, it's horrible, and yeah, and they go to their room, and the next morning you go in and say, hey, how are you? You know, what do you want for breakfast? By the way, you know I love you, and I had to do that, because you need to know that you can't get away with that stuff. That's wrong. But it doesn't change the fact that I love you, you know, and, and you're my kid. You know, now let's move on from there, okay? That's exactly what God does in the Old Testament, over and over again. He punishes because punishment was required. And yeah, this is on a cosmic scale, so some of the punishments we look at go, whoa, you know, yeah. scary. But God had to do something to make a point, and he wasn't dealing with one little kid. He was dealing with a whole nation of people. And yet always, he comes back and says, but you know I love you. And you know you are my people. Just like you are my son, you are my daughter. And we are still in this together, and this doesn't change anything, but you need to not do that. Because when you do that, I have to respond. And if we think we have to respond as a parent, God, who is a holy and righteous God who cannot accept sin, how much more is it necessary for him to respond? So yeah, people who read as far as the judgment parts of the Old Testament and stop... They're left with this idea that God's mean and awful. But keep reading. You know, why is it that that happens so many times? Because after each time, God takes them back and says, I still love you. You are still my sons and my daughters and my people. And we are still in this together. I have not revoked my covenant to you. That would be like saying you're still part of our family. And yet, when you do things that are out of line, I do have to respond. And you understand that. And I think the Israelites, as awful as it was for them, after it happened, they would go, oh, okay, God, yeah, you know, we deserve that. Ron, and then Kenneth. Uh, a friend and I were discussing a few years ago raising recalcitrant sons, and he said... As a hobby, or...? <laughs> it, was, it could have been a hobby, but okay. anyway, he sent his son to your room, to your room, and then he thought, gee, I wish I, I could do that. Because he's got a TV in there and has yeah. uh, PlayStation, PlayStation and, and yeah. all kinds of good stuff, and I have to go to work. But, but you put him in the closet, and the authorities show up. It's just <laughs> <laughs> you're talking about the kids and the, you know, the kids. Yeah. yeah, it's true. I mean, yes. Well, you know, the funny thing is, see, God explained all that to him going into the whole process. He explained, look, I'm going to I lay before you life and death, and when you fall away. Or you pursue sin, this is what I'm going to do, and as soon as you repent, I'm going to take you back. Right. And it's, uh, it's like, should we be surprised? Or why are we surprised when that's exactly what happens when that's right. explained going into it? Yeah, and it's also true, too, when we talk, when we look at this and say, well, God, you know, caused people to be killed and, you know, bitten by poisonous serpents, and, and they seem so horrible. Some of the stuff these people did was horrible. When they, when they went away and started worshiping foreign gods, that meant they were getting involved in child sacrifice. You know, and they were doing horrible things. It wasn't just like, okay, just slap my wrist. That's all I need. That's all I deserve for this. No. They were doing horrific things. Things that probably if somebody did today, we would suggest that they deserve the death penalty. And you got didn't kill everybody who did that. He sort of made an example of some of them. And yet, people think, oh, God is so mean. And yet, if, if God had not been... The righteous judge he was, I've used this, I used this analogy in our new members class. If we hired, that is we elected, you know, we elected and, and employed a judge in our courts. 
And everybody who came to that judge, the judge says, oh, yeah, I know you were stealing, but that's okay. Just don't do it anymore. Go ahead. Oh, I know you killed four people, but don't kill anybody else because that's not good. Go ahead. Go on. Oh, well, I know. You know, you, you, you kidnapped four children and held them for ransom, but, well, I know that you don't really mean it. So go ahead. Would we elect that judge again? Or would we say, no, that's not, the, that's not what a judge is for. That's not what a judge is supposed to do. Well, if we believe that's true in terms of human judges, how much more the judge who is the righteous and holy <coughs> judge of the whole universe, that he should hold people accountable for the horrendous things they did. If anything, we should be astonished by how much God withheld his judgment. You know, there were at least twice when Moses was around that God says to Moses, okay, that's it. I am just going to wipe them all out. We'll start all over again, me and you, and I'll, I'll make you a great people. And Moses says, don't do that, God. And God inter Moses intercedes with God. Now, whether God was just trying to make a point with Moses or God really did, you know, that, that there's a theology that God can't change. And yet, it sounds in a number of places in the Old Testament like God changes his mind. We don't really understand that. We can, have to confess. And yet, the point is that, that the people deserved it. The people deserved to be annihilated, and yet God didn't. And when he did judge, it was always strictly limited in terms of his punishment. Again, if anything, we should be astonished at how much God has withheld his righteous judgment rather than how often he has expressed it. Run. In the Old and New Testament, we continue to see the punishment for crime of God taking direct action against people plagues, so on and so right. on. Does God continue, in your opinion, in the current age that we live in, put plagues or death or destruction upon nations or people? I think that in the same way we looked at the passage earlier from Charles Kinley, that sometimes the results of sin are, um, on our lives are like machinery. When it gets out of gear, you know, it can, it can tear itself up. I think that some of the things that we see in society, wars and things of that sort, may be a result of some of those kinds of things. The extent to which God, you know, does that. The, the, the environment, talking about the Hebrew people, where God had been very, very clear, here are the rules and here are the consequences, then the idea that God would be very proactive in his judgment about those things is a somewhat different circumstance than what we have today with the larger human population many of whom don't know, you know, the rules, so to speak. And for that reason, I think, if anything, God is more gracious now, because God is not quick to judge, and he certainly is not quick to judge those who don't know what they should know. We don't know how God is going to deal with all that at the end of time. That's a long way of saying that there may be some of those things which are a product of human, the outpouring of human sinfulness. I think it is less likely, or less often at least, that God sends judgment in the terms of, disasters or plagues or, you know, whatever than in the time of the Hebrews because the rules are somewhat different now than they were then in terms of what the people know. And God is not an unrighteous, you know, judge. 